world wants to remove God as the creator of the heavens and the earth. But we just sang about what a powerful God that he is, that with his words he could say, let there be, and everything that we see is here today because we have a powerful God that spoke it into existence. And yet there's people out there that say, no, 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 it wasn't God. It was random chance. It was all just a big accident. It was a coincidence. We just got so lucky that here we are. And everything works out just right because, well, we got lucky. You remember Goldilocks and the Three Bears? You remember that story from when you were a kid? Maybe you read it to your own kids. And, and you have this girl that goes into a house, and remember one chair is too big and one chair is too small, but there's one that's just right. And, and then she sits down to eat some porridge, and one bowl is too hot and one's too cold, but one is just right. Well, then she wants to take a nap. She goes upstairs, and one bed is too hard. One is too soft, but one is just right. And throughout that story, she keeps finding everything to be just right to meet her needs. But you know the earth on which we live is just right. Some scientists refer to earth, and they refer to this whole concept as the Goldilocks theory. Everything about earth is just right. We talked about that with our kids this week in VBS. The distance and the size of the sun, the distance between the earth and the sun, the size of the sun, it's just right for us to live here. The distance between us and the moon and the size of the moon is just right for us to live here. It almost looks as if someone did that on purpose, doesn't it? It almost looks as if somebody said, I'm going to make the sun just big enough and just far enough away. And I'm going to do the same thing with the moon. And I'm going to do the same thing with the laws of physics and the laws of gravity. I'm going to do the same thing with everything they need in order for them to live here. It almost looks like someone intelligent did it on purpose. And yet people undermine that and say, coincidence, just worked out that way, just got lucky, like Goldilocks. It's just right, and we benefit because of it. I think that's the greatest assault against our God is to look at what he has made and to say, nah, he didn't do that. This morning in the book of Colossians, the first chapter, if you want to turn there, our theme verse for VBS, we're going to see that Jesus Christ is preeminent, a word that Paul uses. That basically means that Jesus Christ is the best there's ever been. That he has no rival, that he has no equal, like we just sang about. And I get lost in a song like that, just thinking about what an incredible God we serve. That even though there may be people that lie about him, undermine him, hate him, and curse him, nobody can stand up to him. There is no one like the name of Jesus. But even though our culture today, there's this assault on God as the creator, that's nothing new. In the city of Colossae, it was the same thing. Paul wrote this letter to address those that did not believe even 2,000 years ago that God was the creator. People in the city of Colossae, they believed that all matter is evil. And matter is what makes everything. You're made up of matter. The pew you're sitting on is matter. Your clothes are matter. It's all matter. And they believe that all matter is evil. You look around and you see sin and death and suffering, and they say, it's all evil. Everything out there is evil. And if all matter is evil, then no good God would ever have made matter. And that's what they taught. God's not the creator. God created Jesus, they said. He created the angels but the people in Colossae believed that it was one of those fallen angels, one of those demons, maybe Satan himself, that created the world. God never would have made anything that's bad. And furthermore, no God ever would have put on flesh and walked among us. They say Jesus was not God. He could not have been God because no God would wear a sinful body. But that's the beauty of Jesus, that God was willing to come down to us and become like us not sin like us, but he died because of our sin. Paul wrote a letter to Colossians to contradict that belief that God is not the creator. And I believe what he said to the Colossians is just as important for us today because we live in a society that contradicts God as the creator. If you're in chapter 1, we're only going to look at five verses this morning. If you take notes, number one is this. Paul presents Jesus as the fullness of God. Jesus is the fullness of God. Look in verse 15, and then we'll drop down to 18. He begins by saying this, Who is Jesus? Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature? In verse 18, he says, again about Jesus, He is the head of the body, the church. 
who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he, Jesus, might have the preeminence. For it pleased the Father that in Jesus should all fullness dwell. He says that in Jesus is the fullness of God. These people believe that, yeah, Jesus walked on earth, but he wasn't God. He, he was someone created by God. He was someone sent from God. Maybe he was an angel, but he was not God. Paul says, yes, he was. Paul presents them as not just from God, but the fullness of God. In Jesus, he says, is every bit of God the Father. In Jesus is every bit of the Holy Spirit. And Jesus himself is God. He presents him as not a good person, not a prophet or a messenger, but God in the flesh. It pleased the Father to put in Jesus all of the Godhead. He makes the same case in the second chapter, verse 9. If your Bible's still open, look maybe across the page or turn one over in verse 9. He says, For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Or to put that in today's English, all of the Godhead is in bodily form. When Jesus walked on earth in this human body, yes, made of matter, but filled up with the Godhead. All of God was put in bodily form in Jesus. In verse 15 it says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God. The motto for VBS this week was searching the visible and finding the invisible. Everything we can see, everything that's visible, points to the one who is invisible. Everything we see points to God. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. What does God the Father look like? Well, we can't describe him. And we can't say, well, what color was his hair? How, how tall is he? What's his eye color? No, we can't describe him like that. Because God the Father has no body. Jesus said that God is spirit. And those that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. We don't know what the Father looks like. But we know what Jesus looks like. Jesus is the image of the one who's invisible. He is the face, if you will, of the Godhead. And Jesus said in the book of John, he said, hey, if you've seen the Father, you've seen me, because if you see me, you've seen the Father. He's not just someone sent from God, he is God. He is every bit as much God as the Father and the Spirit. There's no rank or authority in the Godhead. Don't we rank them like that sometimes? Maybe, maybe subconsciously, well, God the Father, he's at the top, then followed by the Son, and then a distant third is the Holy Spirit. I think that's how the Baptists sometimes might rank the Trinity. But, but that's not how it is. They are co-equal, and Jesus is every bit of the Godhead wrapped up in a human body. The word image here in our English Bibles, it comes from a Greek word, icon which gives us our English word icon. You know what an icon is? A representation of something else. You open up your computer and you double click on something, that's called an icon. You wanna to go to the internet, you double click on that icon. It represents where you're trying to go. Jesus is the icon of God. He is the picture of the one who is invisible. The author of Hebrews in chapter one, verse three, that says Jesus is the perfect essence of God. You want to know what God is like? Look at Jesus. You want to know what, what would God do? Look at what Jesus did. Jesus is God. He is not partially God. He is the fullness of God. And it's important that we understand that. Church, church member, visitor, have you submitted yourself to Jesus as the Lord of your life? You can't separate the two. Well, I believe in God, but, but not Jesus. He better be the Lord of your life. He's the fullness of God, but number two, he is the firstborn of creation. We already saw it in the 15th verse, but look at it again. It says, Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. What does it mean that Jesus is the firstborn? I'll tell you what the Jehovah's Witnesses say. If you come on Wednesday nights, we've been talking about cults. We talked about the Jehovah's Witnesses. They say that Jesus was the, first, the firstborn of and then everything else followed him, meaning that God created Jesus, and then Jesus, in turn, created everything else. So the Jehovah's Witnesses say that Jesus created everything, but God first created Jesus. And they use this verse to make their case. 
He's the firstborn, and then everything else was born after him. And while firstborn can certainly refer to chronological order, I have two children, Reagan is my firstborn. She was born first. But that's not what this word most often means. It doesn't refer to a timeline as much as it refers to rank and authority. The term firstborn is used throughout the Bible to refer to the most important person in a list. You could be the third or fourth born chronologically, but be the first born as in rank or position or authority. Jesus is the first born, not in that he was born first or created first, because there were lots of people born before Jesus. Cain and Abel were born before Jesus was born on earth. He wasn't the first person ever born. But would you agree that he's the most important person ever born? His birth changed everything. In the book of Psalms, in in Psalm 89, verse 27, a prophecy of the Messiah, it says that he will be made the firstborn over all the kings of the earth. Is Jesus the first king to ever be born? No. But he is outranking every king before him, every king after him, and every person in power today. He's the most important, not firstborn as far as the timeline goes. See, look at verse 18. It says again that Jesus is the firstborn from the dead. Was he the first person to ever die? No, Abel was the first person to ever die. But Jesus is the most important death in all the world. Or does it mean the firstborn from the dead, that he was the first person to come back to life? He wasn't. Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. He wasn't the first person to ever come back to life. But his resurrection is by far the most important resurrection in the history of the world. For without his death, without his resurrection, there's no hope of salvation for us. So he is preeminent. That's what this verse says, in all things, he might have the preeminence. And we need to make sure that we worship him as such, that we acknowledge him as the one that outranks everyone and everything. In verse 18, it says, he is the head of the body. This church, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this verse right now. In a few weeks, when, when we wrap up Romans We're going to start a series on the church, a church that soars. And we're going to talk about being the church that we are supposed to be. And I'll come back to this verse. But but let's just make sure that we pause and remember right now that Jesus Christ is the head of this body. This is his church. It's not yours. It's not mine. It's his. And he's the head. I am not the head of this church. The deacons are not the head of this church. And you are not the head of this church. Sorry if that bursts any bubbles here today. But I would much rather Jesus be the head of this organization, wouldn't you? Maybe today you need to let go of the power that you think that you have to control this place. You think that you should be the sole decision maker. I would much rather Jesus be the decision maker. How does that work? Well, you've hired me to to fill a position. You every year elect deacons to a position. You elect people through nominating teams and, and to, to teach Sunday school classes. And, and, and we, we put people in positions, but ultimately we want to make sure that everything we do comes from God because this is his place. We are his bride and we are to be his arms and his legs, his hands and his feet to do what he wants us to do. Not what we want to do. We can form a club if we want to do what we want to do. Go join a club. Start your own. But this already is taken by Jesus. He died to make this place, and it's all about him. So this church, and I'll say this again in a few weeks, but every decision we make, we first ask ourselves, why are we here? What's the church all about? And then the decisions we make comes out of that. What we do, does it help us carry out our mission? When we have vacation Bible school, is that to help us reach children? Is that to help us win the lost? Okay, well then let's do it. And so we must look at things and say, is this what Jesus would want us to do? Is this why he put us here? He is the head of this place. He has the preeminence in the church. Not the biggest tither, not the one who's been here the longest, not the one who stands here, but Jesus has the preeminence in this place. And we must always remember that it's his. If Jesus were simply the firstborn and not the most important, then how can he be the only begotten? Think about that. If he's just the firstborn, then how's he the only begotten? He can't be both. If God only had Jesus and then created everything else, then he wouldn't be the only begotten. We would all be begotten by God. But Jesus sits in a special place as the firstborn 
over every created thing. Jesus is the fullness of God. Number two, he's the firstborn from creation. But number three, and finally, he is the founder of all. He, he is the founder of everything. He is the one that created what we see. The Colossians couldn't believe it. They could not comprehend Jesus creating sinful things. But it wasn't sinful when he made it. He said, it's very good. On the first day, he said, that's very good. The second day, he said it again. That's very good. Third day, fourth day, seventh day, it's very good. He didn't create it evil. Satan is the one that corrupted it. But Jesus is the creator. God, he's the founder of all, everything we see. And this is in accordance with Genesis 1 and 2. It's in accordance with John chapter 1 that says all things were made by him. And without him, Paul says it the opposite way. Without him, there's nothing made that was made. He is indeed the founder of everything. Verse 16 and 17 says this, For by him were all things created that are in heaven and in earth, the visible and the invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. That means he predates everything. And by him all things consist. Many of the Colossians believe that Jesus was just an angel, an emanation from God, something God made, and he just kind of gave him some orders. Just go tell people about me, Jesus. And, and that's why he talks about these uh, thrones or dominions, these principalities or powers. The principalities and powers refers to the angels, the good and the bad. And Jesus is the creator of those things. He's not an angel. He made the angels. They submit to him. They answer to his orders. He was not just a created angel, but he's over them all. The visible and the invisible. Everything you see, God made it. You look in the mirror, he made you. You look at the mirror, he made that. Everything we see is because God is the creator. But what does the invisible mean? You know, there's so much out there that you and I will never see with our own eyes. There are things yet to be discovered. There are planets out there that don't have names. And all the things that we might consider invisible because we can't see them. And there's so much out there far beyond us on this little planet in this one solar system out in outer space. He's made it all, everything that we see. He is before all things. He predates it all. But by him it says all things consist. That means Jesus is currently holding all things together. When he said let there be, that wasn't the end. He maintains it. He keeps it going. You know about the law of gravity? And all these laws, all these laws of physics. Jesus is the one making all that stuff continue to obey what he told it to do way back in the week of creation. He continues to hold it together. If you were to stop, read the book of Revelation. That's what's going to happen. John said that this, this heaven, this earth, is going to melt away. How is it going to melt away? I believe Jesus will simply stop holding it together and let it take its natural course. Scientists today are baffled by the fact that protons stick together. They say there, there's no explanation for why protons don't just explode. And if they exploded, we'd have atomic bombs like Hiroshima. Every proton in the universe would begin exploding. And they have no understanding of what keeps them together because no laws of physics explains protons holding themselves together. Well, I have a theory on that. I believe Jesus holds all things together. I believe he holds the protons together. And when someone with a wall of diplomas and PhD says, I have no idea what holds it together, Jesus says, I do. And you're never going to understand it. I hold it together because I want to. And when I'm all done with this, one day there'll be a new heaven and a new earth. I'll stop holding those little protons together and you will see the earth melt away when I'm all done with it. He holds it together. You think about these laws. I heard somebody say this one time. I don't, he said, I don't think there's no God. He says, I know there is no God, just like I know the law of gravity is true. And I thought about that. The law of gravity. If there's no God, who's the law giver? If there's no God, who makes sure that it obeys the law? Who's the judge of the law? You can't have a law without a law giver. And, and what makes gravity obey its own laws? What makes gravity say, 
yeah, I just don't feel like being gravity today. It's random chance, and yet it's governed by a law? That doesn't make sense. Explosions lead to chaos, not order, not laws, not structure. What makes gravity obey its own laws? Jesus says, I hold all things together. So you can't say, I know there's no God, and I believe in the laws of physics. It doesn't make sense. You have to pick one, because Jesus holds it all together. As we think about the invisible things, I want to show you something I, I thought about just trying to say, but it's much better to see it. There's about a three-minute video clip from Francis Chan we're going to watch. And, and each night during VBS, we come out here and we do ridiculous skits. And, and the kids would kind of chuckle, but they weren't really funny. But we, we tried to teach the kids a little bit about the vastness of the universe, the stars and the planets and the sun and the moon. Uh, but, uh, Kevin, if you will, we're going to uh, play a quick video, and I'm going to come back and we'll finish uh, after we watch this quick video. What, what, what you're seeing right now. First of all, this is the Earth, okay? This is just, you're taking off from the Earth from Southern California, and we're going we're gonna to rise up for a little bit here, okay? We're going to pull away from it. We're going to pull higher. Now, this is at about 10 kilometers. Like, if you climb Mount Everest, this is what you'd see. You'd see the curvature of the Earth. From that distance. Now you're going to climb up even higher. This is at 100 kilometers. And you're a fourth of the way to the space station now. This is what you'd see. If you get to this level, you're considered an astronaut. Just if you ever get there. Okay, now we're going 100,000 kilometers. 100,000 kilometers from the Earth. You're a fourth of the way to the moon. That's what the Earth would look like. Now we're going to pull away to a million kilometers. At a million kilometers, there's the moon. Okay, there's the moon. You can barely see the Earth. You're at a million kilometers now. You're past the, past the moon. And uh, now we're going to go to 100 million kilometers. 100 million kilometers. You're still not to the sun. The sun's 93 million miles away. But now we're going to go to 10 trillion kilometers. Ten, there's the sun. Okay. You just passed the sun. Now you would see all of the planets at 10 trillion kilometers. And now... We're at 10 to the 15th power. That means 10 with 15 zeros. I don't know what that number is. 15 zeros, and the sun's just like a bright dot amidst other stars. And now we're going to 10 light years away. At 10 light years away, come on, let's go. Zoom, there you go. 10 light years away. Now you just see the sun with like 11 other stars that are kind of its neighbors. You know, that, 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 that's our sun. And now we're going to go a thousand light years away. At a thousand light years away, you, you wouldn't even see our sun anymore. These are just a bunch of stars close to it in this cluster inside the Milky Way. Now we're going to zoom out even further, and that's the Milky Way we live in. See that cluster of stars? Those are about 100,000 stars that are closest to our sun. You can't see our sun anymore at this point. Now this is our Milky Way galaxy, and forget about the Earth. Okay, there's our Milky Way galaxy that we live in. Um, and we're just buried in there somewhere, and we're going to pull out even further, and you'll see that our galaxy is actually, it's, it's a big galaxy, and, uh, and all those other things you're seeing now are galaxies, and we're going to pull away 10 million light years now. His next scene is 10 million light years. Those are all galaxies you see amidst our Milky Way, several hundred galaxies. Now we're going to go 100 million light years away. This is the last one. We're going to zoom out to 100 million light years. Those are all clusters of galaxies. Galaxies and clusters of galaxies. You won't even see our Milky Way galaxy anymore amidst that. We don't have telescopes that go beyond that little sphere there. You might have had trouble seeing some of that. That's kind of the point. Uh, the, the further back we go, the less we can see. Do you see yourself anywhere in there? And, and I know that this is all there is to life for us is this planet. But, but to just keep backing up and backing up and backing up and thinking God made all of that. Does it make you feel kind of small in this big universe? The farther back we go. And I know that this is, this is all there is to life for us because we don't really have any business on Mars. So this is really life to us. But God made all that out there. When he talks about that, he also made the invisible. I think that's all the invisible. 
Yeah, we can see it now with some telescopes, but, but we haven't scratched the surface of what's out there. Scientists believe that there are hundreds of billions of galaxies, and galaxies contain hundreds of billions of stars, trillions upon trillions of stars. And I believe God knows every one of them by name. The, the ones that we don't have names for them yet, and God's already a step ahead of us out there. Uh, just two ways to, to kind of compare this, and I did this with the kids a couple days ago, but, but this is a quarter, as you can tell. Uh, if you, to, to make a comparative ratio, to put this on the same scale, our solar system, which is the Earth, our sun, our moon, seven other planets, sorry, Pluto, used to be nine planets, but, but Pluto's in that, and it's just not a planet. You take our entire solar system, these planets you see hanging from the chandeliers, on a comparative scale, if our entire solar system was a quarter, and then you compare that to the Milky Way, the Milky Way would be the size of North America. 49 states and Canada, all of that, just, that's just our galaxy. So this isn't Earth. This is Earth and seven planets and the sun and the moon, all shrunk down to the size of a quarter. Our galaxy would look like North America next to that. And that's one galaxy out of hundreds of billions of galaxies. It blows my mind to think that all that is out there. If Earth was the size of a golf ball, I'm not much of a golfer, but if Earth was the size of a golf ball, the next star closest to the sun would be the size of the Empire State Building stacked on top of itself six times. The star closest to our sun is like six Empire State Buildings compared to a golf ball. But that's not the largest star in our, in our galaxy. There's actually a star that if Earth was the size of a golf ball and we were to put it at the base of Mount Everest, the largest star in our solar system would be like Mount Everest compared to a golf ball. That is our Earth where we live compared to a star in our galaxy. Hundreds of billions of stars like Mount Everest to a golf ball, hundreds of billions of those make up one galaxy and hundreds of billions of galaxies all throughout the universe. The sun is 93 million miles from us. That seems like a long way. 93 million miles. It takes light eight minutes from the sun to warm our planet. And God put it out there at just the right spot to keep us warm. This is that Goldilocks theory. If the sun was any closer to us, we would be incinerated. If the sun was any larger at the same distance, we'd be incinerated. If it was any farther away or any smaller, our planet would be covered in snow year-round and no one could live here. If the moon was any closer to us, just any closer, it would cause the earth to tilt on its axis towards the moon and we'd be incinerated by the sun. If the moon was any closer, if the sun was any closer, and God put it all exactly where it needs to be, I'd say that's intelligent design at its finest. How in the world can we say that's an accident? How in the world can we say that's random chance? Paul said, no, that God made it. Jesus holds it together so that in all things he can have the preeminence. Why did God do all that? What's the point of all those stars? It's so that when we begin to glimpse and see what else is out there, we can look at all that and say, what a powerful name it is. What an incredible God we serve. That there is no doubt in my mind that there is something out there that's holding this all together. It's not random chance. It's God. And if it's God, what does he say? If he made all the stars, guess what else he made? He made you. And he loves you. He made the stars to show off his power. The heavens declare the glory of God. He made you because he loves you. He made you because he wants a relationship with you. He made you because he wants to spend eternity with you. But he made you because he wants to spend today with you. Jesus died, he's the firstborn from the dead, so that your sins can be forgiven to make the relationship possible. He loves you that much. If you don't have a relationship with God, what are you waiting for? He made you to spend time with you. Heaven is great, I can't wait. But heaven has already begun in the life of a believer. Make sure you spend time today with the God of the universe, the one who made all things, we don't just wait till heaven to talk to God. We talk to him right now. 
If you've never put your trust in this God, He is such a big God. He can handle your problems, your concerns. Try talking to Him today. We're going to have a time of invitation like we do every week. And maybe God has laid something on your heart today that you want to talk to Him about. He can handle it, I promise you. Maybe today you want to bow your knee before Him and say, look, I've known about Him, I, I, you know, I've kind of believed in Him, but I've never, I never understood Him like that today. I want to put my trust in God. Do that today before it's too late. I want you to stand, please, if you would, with your heads bowed, your eyes closed. I don't want you to look around at other people. I don't want you to think about anything else. I just want you to think about yourself right now, or maybe think about yourself being lost in this huge, huge, huge universe that God has made. And if God made each one of those stars, He made you. But you know, He cares about you. He's got this entire universe to hold together, and He still cares about what burdens you today. He cares about your problems. He cares about what you're struggling with. And He says that we can cast those cares on Him because He cares for us. Even while He's holding those protons together, He wants to hear about your problems. Lay those problems at the feet of Jesus today. He's a big God and He can handle it. Maybe today, though, you want to say, I need to be saved. I need to put my faith and my trust in Jesus. Pray right where you are. Say, God, save me. Or maybe you want to come down here and pray with somebody. We would love to do that. Maybe He's laid something else on your heart today. I'm going to pray. And when I say amen, I, I don't want you to worry about singing, to flip in your hymnal. I don't want you to think about anything else. Just keep your eyes closed and just think about who you are in comparison to this universe, lost in this massive galaxy, and yet having a God that loves you so much, that knows the number of hairs on your head. And just contemplate that today and talk to God. Pray to him about whatever's on your heart. He's big and he's powerful and he loves you and he cares. So lift it up to him this morning. Lord, I want to pray right now for everyone here that you would work in our hearts. Lord, if there's something we need to do today to be right with you, let us do it. If there's something you've challenged us to do today, let us do it. If someone needs to get saved today, God, let them do it. Maybe they'll step out from where they are and come kneel down here, come talk to somebody, or they'll pray where they stand. But Lord, I pray in these next few minutes we would talk to you. Thank you for who you are, how big you are, and how much you love us. And I ask this prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. As the musicians are playing, at least